Hello and welcome to Better Under Pressure. I'm Sarah Milne author of The Shed Method and founder of Coaching Impact. And in this podcast, I talk to leaders from all walks of life about being better under pressure and using pressure for better. I want to explore how we handle pressure in a world that is becoming more and more complex, the impact that that pressure has on our ability to perform at our best and what we do to be better under pressure. I'm going to take the pressure off. I had to talk to myself and say, you've got two kids. One of them is, I think she was two or three. You've got a full-time job. You are managing a team. You're juggling so much. Just tell yourself, you just need to get your masters. My relationship with pressure is is a relationship with me. Mm -hmm. I am pressure. You're looking at pressure here. It doesn't sit. There's no one right now giving me the pressure but myself. And so when I manage that pressure, I have to talk to myself. Today, I'm talking to Zani Mashinini, who heads up a team of HR specialists at the South African Reserve Bank. Prior to that, she worked for organizations like Unilever, Pearson, Bank of New York, and the South African National Treasury. As well as a leader in the field of HR, Zani is also a speaker, coach, and mentor who thrives on creating organizational transformation programs that improve the workplace experience for all. She has a master's in management from the Wits Business School and recently received an excellence award for her contribution to the human resources industry. In this conversation, she shares why the phrase no choice became a source of power, what she means by bad day behavior and how a tea bag helped her change. Zani, thank you so much for joining me on Better Under Pressure. Oh, it's a pleasure. Um, I'm glad to be here. And I suspect I'm going to learn in, in the process. Well, I'm not sure about that, but I know that I'm, I know that you'll have lots of very useful things to share on the subject. So maybe start with, when do you remember experiencing pressure? I have a very vivid memory of uh, myself as a young girl in high school, fearing Sunday evenings. I had this big fear of Sunday because of going back to another school week um, and fearing Monday, that Monday morning. didn't realize at the time this was my relationship with pressure. It's only now that I reflect and realize and recognize how I experience pressure and what triggered it. Um, so every Sunday, I'd be very nervous about going to school. Uh, I'd be nervous about being able to show up well in a classroom. I was nervous about being able to achieve whatever standards were set um, for me at the time. And very nervous around um, doing better than I did the previous week. It's a very strange feeling, but I, I have a very clear memory of that experience and that feeling. And how do you recognize, so oh, so many questions actually. First of all, what, what do you think put the pressure on you? Or, or did you, was this a pressure that you had created yourself for the performance at school? Or was it, was it from another source? What a good question, because I'm still asking myself that very same question. At times I reflect and I go, is it my parents? Um, mm-hmm. Is it my social circle? Is it the school that I went to? Um, so by the way, I'm an only child. So I can't okay. say there was this competition amongst the siblings. So it definitely wasn't that. But if I reflect, I remember being in a very tight social circle where it was about who was going to be the first at achieving something. Maybe it is the social circle, I'm not sure. Or it could be a combination because my parents were very clear at the time that I had no choice but to do well given the background um, or given my background and where I grew up and the circumstances under which we grew up. There was no choice but to succeed because you don't get chances of going to good schools often. Um, And so it was this one time that you had. Yeah. No choice. That's, that's, that's a pressured sentence in itself, isn't it? (laughs) No choice. Yeah. And, and, um, 
And so how, how did you recognize that pressure on a Sunday? Well, it does start with, you know, the sound of the television, right? Because there is a routine on a Sunday evening. Um, there's certain programs that um, get turned on on the telly um, on a Sunday evening. And that sound just triggers yes. that feeling. Um, and as soon as the sun sets, that feeling comes. As soon as um, it goes quieter, um, in the evening, uh, those are all the kind of triggers of it's that time. Yeah. Um, and so you, because it happens so often, it's every week, right? Yeah. <laughs> You're yeah. bound to not forget that feeling and not forget the triggers and not forget um, the feeling and what creates or triggers the feeling. Yeah. And and do you, is your memory of that? Um experience zani um a useful one i mean does does it in in relation to you know, as you think about it now and potentially when you feel those sorts of triggers again is it as you look back on it is it a positive force for you when you when you reflect on that it it wired me it started okay. wiring me um my wires are very very fixed on focus, discipline, and ethic, work ethic. I started to use my Friday evenings as the solve for this whole um, very peculiar, peculiar experience. So on Fridays, I never used to down tools. I used to say Friday is no pressure day because tomorrow is Saturday. Like I had so much time to do anything that I needed to do to make Sunday feel better. It started that small. So I just started to use my Friday evenings to get prepared for the next week and didn't want anything to create that added pressure on a Monday. And so today, that is the work ethic I have. I, so? So I, I clear, the to, in today's um, world that I'm in, I clear my week before starting a new week. I will not allow an old week to be part of my new week. Um, because a new week comes with so many unknowns and just creates that snowball effect. I mean, I remember school teachers drilling it into us not to wait too late to study because of that snowball. I'll never forget that analogy, the teacher wow. talking about the snowball effect. And that is still in my memory. I remember even in university, uh, students used to skip lectures or um, use the study week to prepare for, um, for, for exams. And I remember going to lectures once, twice, repeating the same lecture, just so that when study week comes, I'm just literally turning the page and relaxing. Gosh, it sounds like such a positive force for you that. And I, I love that phrase of let's close the week down yeah. before starting a new week, as best you can anyway, in a way so that you can take that Saturday yeah. as a like a no pressure day, a, a, like a, a day for... Absolutely. For what though? What was what was a no pressure day for you then on a Saturday? The young girl or as an adult? Oh, as a young girl first. Let's start with the young girl. What what was a no pressure day on a Saturday for you? So a Saturday for me was an opportunity to be with friends, um, be with family. I remember being an only child. I was fortunate that in my family. There's no such thing as a cousin in my family. We're all sisters. We're all brothers. Um, and so for me, the weekend was always about um, being with my sisters, my brothers, my family, and completely forget um, what I needed to forget um, so that I could be in that moment and enjoy. Um, and so there was no pressure on a Saturday. It, I was completely switched off. I still switch off today. So that's another sort of prize I think I got from this is that I can switch off. People don't believe I, I can't, but I can switch off. Um, and I make sure that I find those little, I call them things or whatever it is that will help me switch off because it's so important for me to switch off. Um, I've realized the, you know, the constant thinking and reflecting on, what's coming um, only makes me, you know, um, 
think about it in a worse way. You know, it doesn't actually prepare me for for anything. It actually Gosh. makes me sit down. I mean, that sounds so helpful. <laughs> you know, that, that 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 feeling of pressure as a young child has given yeah. you almost a drill now that yeah. you've never lost. And it's and I'm really intrigued to know how you parcel up a week, Zani, and how you allow yourself to switch off. What yeah. what is it? Can you break that down for us? What is it that you have drilled with yourself yeah. consciously, but now seems incredibly unconscious and actually just a way of being for you? Can you yeah. can you unpick that a bit? So I. As a result of how I grew up and what I put in place as a young girl, for instance, I do make sure I sleep. So, so there's, there's somebody who, did, who doesn't believe me. We had a long conversation this morning and she said, no, I get four hours sleep and that's enough. I said, you know, actually, um, you know, um, like I said, people don't believe, or colleagues of mine or friends of mine won't believe when I say I actually do get enough sleep. So I sleep early. That's the first thing. And and early are, meaning what? Just tell us what early means for you. Oh, I could sleep at seven. Wow. Yeah. Um, and fortunately, with my two kids, they're in bed. So I've given them the same discipline. So my kids are out by 7 p.m. And so as soon as I put them in bed, I end up, you know, falling asleep as well with them. So that does help, but that's not what drives me to sleep early. I've always been somebody who sleeps early. I remember university, my friends would all gather in their, in their dorms and I'd be the one sleeping on the bed while they're chattering away. But I found that allows me to then be up early. So by four in the morning or five in the morning, I'm able to start my day. Right. I'm also most productive in the early hours of the morning. I did a little technical evaluation. I measured how well I do or how productive I, I am doing my master's work during the day, in an mm -hmm. afternoon, a uh, weekend, versus doing it early hours. I scored 7% lower on my overall marks by doing my work during the day versus early hours of the morning. I also so, get through the work quicker as well. It was fantastic. I just made, it was my own evaluation. I just wow. realized. So yeah. the 7%, the 7% was your, was a, was a mark? Was it a measure that you were getting back from the work that yeah. you were producing yeah. Yeah. by somebody else, by an external yeah. Um, assessor? Uh, yeah. And then okay. Assessor. Wow. I'll tell you the marks. That, they were not high marks because I told myself for well, my master's program, I'm going to take the pressure off. I had to talk to myself and say, mm. you're not going to get an A, Zani. You've got two kids. One of them is, I think she was two or three. Um, so you're not going to get an A. You've got a full-time job. You are managing a team. You're juggling so much. Just tell yourself, you just need to get your master's. That was a conversation I had to talk to myself because my relationship with pressure is, my, is a relationship with me. Mm -hmm. I am pressure. You're looking at pressure here. It doesn't sit. There's no one right now giving me the pressure but myself. And so when I manage that pressure, I have to talk to myself. So I got 77%, 78%, you know, for different categories of the actual research paper, um, having done the work um, early hours of the morning. And I had to resubmit it because that was the preliminary mark. Uh, when I resubmitted it, I got an overall 70. Mm -hmm. And so today I bite myself because I knew what I could get, even though I told myself what's possible and isn't possible. But it was a lesson to me about how I coped with pressure back then and uh, what happened when I didn't listen to myself, thinking I could do things at a time when it wouldn't help me. Um, but I just thought that for me are some of the examples to share around how I deal with, with that pressure at the time. You know, doing wow. a, a master's program and juggling everything is just an example um, of that. So, so interesting about the fact that you um, have made that assessment of the time of the day that you work 
most effectively and you put some data behind it for yourself which is yeah. amazing because I wonder how many of us do that and what it would be like if we did whether we I'm sure we'd claw back so much much time and energy for ourselves if we did that. The level of inquiry that Zani is sharing here is fascinating. It's really got me thinking about how I could gather more data on the time of day when I'm most productive. I mean, I believe that I'm more productive in the morning, but I'm wondering now how to prove that. Can I gather some data to check that assumption, for example? And if I had that, would it boost my commitment to being even more intentional about using that time of the day? I often have this conversation with teams about understanding how they might optimise the team impact by more intentionally using individuals' most productive time of the day for specific things. So a few thoughts before returning to Zani. Do you know when you're most productive? And how do you know, apart from it feeling right? What's your data? And if you do know that you are better in the morning or just before lunch or later in the evening, what do you actively choose to do in those times? How might you optimise the day for your most productive time? Back to our conversation. But secondly, I'm really intrigued as to how, as a young girl, you had a pressure, you had a sentence that was uh, given to you by your family. Uh, there is no choice. You have yep. no choice. You yep. must succeed. Yep. Um, and how you've managed to almost morph that into giving yourself permission around 70, 70 being good enough you know, and I mean, I can think of myself and potentially other people that I work with, Zani, where that drilling of you have got no choice, you've got su you've got to succeed, can become such a high pressure internal dialogue for oneself that right. actually the sort of be perfect driver, particularly, I think, for women, can override everything else. And what you're telling us is that actually you've changed, you can now manage that story to make sense to you in the phase of life that you're in. So as a young mother doing a master's, 70% was absolutely fine and better than fine because of all the other things that you were doing and you didn't put pressure on yourself for that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, but I had to talk to myself, right? Um, mm -hmm. Even now, I still think, goodness, imagine if I just done it this way. <laughs> imagine an 80 or even a 90, you know, if, you know, because I just done what I just, I did what was enough. Yeah, but imagine if I could put in the extra hours or, or whatever. So it's still there. You can hear yes. it. Yes, I can still <laughs> hear it. Yeah, yeah. The pressure voice. <laughs> so, yeah, and that's the coaching. So I was coaching myself through that and yeah. listening to that voice of mine. Yeah, and and did you when you were going into your masters? Did you set that narrative, that internal narrative story up for yourself before the masters? Or did you notice it as the pressure increased doing the masters and then you gave yourself that internal dialogue? I'm just I'm just trying to work out whether that was something you preempted or whether it was something that evolved as you were experiencing the masters and being a young mum. Um, yeah. So no, it it evolved. Okay. I went in thinking I could do my best, which is of course you have to have an A for it. And when it's when I started experiencing and, and feeling the pressure build up taking time off work to to go to class um having to submit um having to do all sorts of things at work and the kids and home and managing the home as a single mother when all of that started to just happen at once that's when i you know you know when you see the red flags you start yeah. realizing this isn't going to work you are yeah. going to have to say to yourself, mm. what is going to have to be good enough for what, you know? Um, and I've seen, I've instilled it in my children as well. So let me not get there yet, but, but it had, it evolved. It was, it's something that um, emerged as the flags became redder and redder and redder. And redder. Yeah. And I, and I had to stop and say, look, you're not going to be able to have, everything go well which is everything must be at at an a grade standard um at the time and the red flags could you describe what those red flags were then and are they still the same red flags now that alert you to the yeah. barometer of pressure going from positive to unhelpful pressure the red flags are the bad day behaviors 
Um, Say more. Bad, yeah. The bad day <laughs> behaviors are impatient, grumpy, um, aggressive, loud, uh, short and sharp, and seeing people's faces when your face changes because I've got, you know, a facial expression that is quite um, uh, vivid as well. And when people see my face of pressure, um, they also, their faces turn and I could just read people in the room that Zani is not showing up well. And it's not good. It's not a good feeling. And mm. I remember every time reflecting around my behavior. And those are the red flags. When I go home, or back then, when you drive back home from the office and you sort of reflect on your day and you just pick up that your behavior wasn't good enough um, mm. and you just didn't make people feel good in the room. I'll never forget an analogy a coach taught me is what kind of um, tea bag are you? Uh, what flavor do you give off when people drink your tea? And that analogy has stuck um has stuck in me um and so that was a red flag is me picturing people drinking this bitter tea of mine <laughs> as opposed to what's the tea that you would love them to to drink how would you describe yeah. the tea what what's the tea that actually for you feels yeah. absolutely you radiating your best yeah. well firstly they'll have a second cup <laughs> um, love that yeah, you know absolutely I always measure whether people call me or give me feedback after an experience with myself but it's the kind of tea that the flavor stimulates people to to also show up better to feel better you know people will smile after they've had a sip people will laugh people will uh, live in the moment with you uh, and people will reflect um, much more positive images, I think, um, after having this um, um, the tea with the right tea bag. Um, <laughs> and I think if I had to taste it myself, you know, it's that feeling that kind of makes you release. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, um, just release. And I think that's important when you experience, you know, positive, you know, things or yeah so so in in this um conversation so far zani i'm hearing two very important factors for you in terms of creating a positive relationship with pressure and that is sleep and self-talk actually what you, you know the story you're telling yourself about what is possible would and you I say think, that's fair yeah i think being one i also practice is being more intentional so when i talk about um, you know, showing up better. It's you've got to actually prepare a lot more uh, for situations. Um, so I over prepare sometimes, uh, which is where the hard work comes in, mm. because it helps you be able to leave less room for things that will create more room for pressure to show up. And so I find a consistent uh, discipline, being disciplined really helps um so i've consistently been a disciplined person mm -hmm. and i think that's from those childhood memories that discipline has helped me not allow that snowball effect to come to life yeah um, because that is what you know creates the fear and then you, you know the whole cycle starts so with that self-awareness you, you you know your your career has been in strong corporate cultures hasn't it quite a few of them and yeah. how do you witness pressure in leaders showing up the most yeah this is where i will talk about women a lot more in an okay. environment where they're they're having to prove themselves all the time that that's the theory and part of my research confirms that women have to work a little bit harder because you'll be the first of, you're the first black woman, the first young woman, you know, that in itself, you know, does does add or, or create the pressure. And so the fairy tales, and I call them fairy tales or fantasies around women leaders will mentor, women leaders will look after you or 
because they come from the spaces that you are in, they'll remember. But that's often not the case. So what you will end up is you will have your queen bee behavior, your devil wears Prada behavior amongst women. You will see that women tend to compete a lot more with each other. And hence the narratives around, you know, how women um, uh, treat each other, you know, the female boss, all of those um, narratives. And 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 remember, this is not to say you don't great you don't get great um, female leaders. Um, this is more around what you often find in these strong um, corporate cultures is that women then are not necessarily going to be the savior of the day for other women. In fact, you might find that women end up repeating or being the mirror of the, the culture that prevents women from thriving and progressing and hence we find ourselves where we are where we're still talking about mm. women and their advancement um, and those are the subtle um, kind of experiences or the realities um, of, of these corporate cultures and, and how do you as a leader within that manage that so what's what's fantastic and 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 it's not all doom and gloom i must say and i'm very excited about these topics is that there's a lot more recognition of this uh we're not solving yet but we are um producing ideas you know we're bringing mindfulness into the conversation a lot more we're getting more books that are um that have women reflecting on their experiences sharing their experiences we're seeing women redesign mentorship and being able to say, hey, I know what you're going through. Um, if it is about pressure, let's talk about it. So this concept of mentoring circles has been fantastic because you get you become vulnerable with other women. You, I, you create a space where you can mm. all talk about the things that bother you. What a lot of women speak about when they're in safe spaces is I've got to be all these six, seven roles at the same time. And I'm struggling to find myself in all those roles. And so all I do is wake up and assume that all of them at the same time. And guess what? I've got to be good at all of them. Mm. Uh, I'm not allowed to not be good in any you know, one of them. So if I'm a mom, I have to be the mom that um, still looks good, still looks great physically. Um, you know, I see all the moms in the parking lots at school. Um, looking great and trying to stay in shape, all those things, you get to work, they're well-dressed and they're showing up in boardrooms. Um, and then of course, when they get home, it's around how, how you manage that as well. Um, I always joke and say I blame the suffragettes because now, yeah. we do everything. now we're doing everything, right? Yeah. <laughs> we're cooking, we're working. You know? yeah. um, uh, so, so, So for me, I think it's very encouraging to see some of the initiatives going on. And for me, I am a big believer in mentorship because I get to see the human you and not the, the, the facade I see in the boardroom. But when we're in a mentoring relationship, you're starting to um, take the peels off, the layers off, and you're helping me identify um, or connect with you at a very authentic level, which means change then can happen. Um, yeah. And so I think that's how um, we are getting through some of this in a very positive way um, and very exciting, actually. Yeah. And and for you, how does that journey of pressure map out for you as you um, expand in your your roles, Zani, and working in, in – you're working for the um, – African bank now, aren't you? So, you know, the Reserve Bank. So, you know, in, in this role that you're in now, how do you m make sure that your pressure is always a force for good? Or do you? And at what point, what are the things that tip your pressure <laughs> into the red flag area? And, and how do you turn it around? Fortunately, what's become more and more important is, is family. Um, and so it's the best example to use in the role I play. So it's with my children at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, true story. I've got a son who probably is 10 times the girl I, explained, I described earlier. <laughs> he's just worse than me. Um, he says to me, Mommy, um, we're on the way to a soccer match. He says, Mommy, what will you do for me if I score a hat trick? 
And there's me driving and going, oh, my poor son, putting all this pressure on himself. So I play along and I go, no, of course, you know, we'll go to the toy store and you can pick whatever toy you like. He's go, thanks, mom. And guess what? He scores a hat trick. I kid you not. This boy goes for it. He does it again. Mommy, what will you do today? What will you do if I score a hat trick? He did this last Sunday. He scores a hat trick at school and um, because he plays soccer outside of school as well. But in school, he said, Mom, um, I don't know if I'm going to make the B team again. Because um, I've said to him, he doesn't have to be in the A team, but he has to be in the B team. Um, can you hear <laughs> how it all plays out? Um, so he doesn't make the B team, he makes the C team. And I've had to then practice how I show up when my son deals with disappointment. But to cut a long story short, he realized after having a conversation with me that we've set standards for ourselves because I know he's able to achieve that. And guess what? He made it back to the B team just from how we speak about um, all of that. But back to the question around my role is I found myself putting the standards, the same standards on my children, um, but having to find a way to make sure that I'm not triggering, you mm. know, the negative around it, but making it positive for him. So what I've tried to create is, is say to him, do your best. And because I know your best, um, that becomes the standard. Your best is not a standard that I've adopted elsewhere. It's a standard that lives within us and especially yourself. You are a young boy that loves to compete, that loves to win, but you understand the work you have to put in to achieve that. And so he's then learned to then do things that way. And when he doesn't make the B team or he doesn't get whatever symbol he needs to get, he understands. And so he knows how to put in the work. And it's sort of, balances it all out because I find when you don't understand how to put in the work, the pressure just becomes toxic, yeah. you know, because it just stays there. You can't do anything with it. But as yeah. soon as you taught yourself how to deal with the pressure, even as a young boy, he's then enjoying what he's doing. He's enjoying the sports and he thrives and he looks forward. Um, and where he's not getting all whatever he wanted to achieve, He's linking it back to well, what input have I made? What I have, well, what have I really put in? Have I put in the work? And hence the work ethic that I've described in me today or talked about earlier. Gosh, that sounds like a very um, a very fine line, doesn't it? I, th I think so no, many no. so many parents can can un can can reflect on that. I'm doing it now. You know, thinking uh, how do you you know recently. Um, I think my, my daughter said to me, you know, how come you let me give that up? How come you let me give up um, yeah. karate? How come you yeah. let me give up this? And I'm thinking, God, at the time, I, I, I was listening to you and wanted you to make that choice. And it felt like you needed to be in control of that choice. And then, you know, like five or six years later, you get that question back at you. It's a yeah. really difficult balance, isn't it, to understand no, no, no. Absolutely. where that lies. And I suppose the same must be as a leader in an organization, Zani. I mean, you went as a parent, but again, how do you model in your role um, yeah. that choice, but also apply what I'm hearing is quite a strong um, expectation that, yeah. that everyone has that choice to, to be yeah. better if they're prepared to put in the work. Absolutely. So when I look at teams I've worked with for many, many years, they'll all tell you that, um, and I think it's changed as well over the years, but there is a theme of an expectation that I do set. I always believe you can't give people expectations that are going to keep them in the same place. It doesn't mm. make sense. <laughs> Why stay where you are? And I often have worked with very talented individuals. And so for me, that combination of you are talent, you are yeah. good at what you do, you've got expertise and capabilities that I believe will take you much further than you can imagine. And so for me, I the first thing I do, I set the expectation. And once I've set the expectation, 
I, I've repeated what others have done for me is that, that I leave the floor all to you. I don't believe that I should be on the floor with you. So that whole analogy of going to the balcony. So I would then prefer to be on the balcony and watch you assume the, the roles you have to on the floor. You will call me to come down and enjoy the dance with you or teach you how to dance or whatever the case may be. But I think that's the second thing that I do is then allow others to kind of experience what they need to experience. When there is a lot of pressure for the team, I often find that your role cannot be one of contributing um, to the pressure. In other words, showing up badly, as I said earlier, mm. it's not going to help um, anyone. You know, I, I find that often I observe leaders will be, will think that it's better to be more aggressive, you know, better to make people feel more tense. But what I found is your patience and your trust in people and believing in them. Mm. It doesn't matter what the outcome will be, but I do believe that in that moment, the power you have as a leader is to make people believe. And that, that you know, if, if people believe mm. that this can happen, that we can do this. And if you help them recognize that the little that they've done is already good enough for the stage we're at of whatever process or project we're in. The fact that you've gone this far and you've tried, it already tells us that we are going to do this. We are going to get this right. And I found that combination of all of that, that's what works. Because as soon as the pressure, managing the pressure with the team is about reminding them of the pressure, reminding them of how you know things are not good enough, I just find that you keep us all in the same place. Mm. Um, and that's yeah. tricky, isn't it? Because pressure yeah. can be so contagious, can't it? And, you know, people no, catch it. No, catch it. Um, especially if you've got strong personalities who are more yeah. vocal. As soon as that person starts, then we're all got that bug, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, yeah. I want to pause here for a minute. I'm taken right back to a couple of teachers that I had as a teenager who really raised my own expectation of what I thought was possible. My violin teacher and my dance teacher. They raised my level of commitment as well as my performance. And now I'm curious how they did that. What I think they had was an invigorating skill that combined positive challenge, a sense of fun, a consistent level of expectation, and, as Zani says, and probably most importantly, belief. I felt their belief in me and what they believed I was capable of. That was what compelled me to achieve more than I thought I could. And yes, it was pressure, and it was definitely pressure for better. I became better because of their judgment of the level of pressure that could make me better. Whether we're looking through the eyes of a parent, leader or friend, raising others to achieve more than they think they can without it becoming a pressure that's overwhelming or unhelpful is a skill. Judging how and when to apply it is also a skill, but the sense of belief that Zani talks about here is for me the secret ingredient. We sniff out those who truly believe in us. Those teachers that I had pushed me because they believed and that belief transferred to me and I began to believe it too. Anyway, back to the conversation. If you were to break it down, Zani, just for, you know, any of us listening thinking right yes there's a lot of pressure around me I'm feeling it I'm catching it I'm being tempted to join into it and in an, in an unhelpful way particularly as a leader of a team that's experiencing pressure how do you stay on the balcony what what is it that you actually do to remind yourself well there's you know the a to remind them of the strengths that they already have that you just explained and also the sort of purpose I think is what I'm hearing you yeah. you also share how do you stay in that space when there's so much pressure around you? What do you do? Yeah, so it can't be about them, right? Um, so when you are in that leadership position, it's about how you are, are managing yourself first. I find that's the starting point, is recognizing that there is pressure for the team. We do have tight deadlines. There's a lot still to be done. And I think... That's the starting point. And then making sure that you are showing up 
um, better because I find as soon as it's about the team and their behavior and they're not doing this, mm. you forget you and then you're suddenly contributing. You're just part of the problem now. But I find when you're sharpening your sword, it's far more effective because then you can show up better. So I think that's the starting point. Um, point the finger at yourself. That That's what I believe. So I ask my question. I ask the questions. Have I given them what they need? Are they clear on what they need to do? Um, have I um, made sure that they know where to go? Have I left, kept the door open? Mm -hmm. um, can they phone me anytime? Can they, whether it's WhatsApp, so those are the questions I ask myself because mm -hmm. I find that if I don't check myself mm -hmm. and I don't go through my checklist as well, then 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 it's almost like we're, you know, this whole rats in the bar barrel <laughs> scenario where you know you just yeah. you're so lost, you're bumping into it's chaos. Yeah. But I think that the work on self keeps me in the balcony. Yeah. I mean, I'm you know, I'm thinking of really terrible deadlines and I just remember getting a phone call uh, a week so this is a week before a project is due we're about to launch it was we were about we were about to launch um something big it was a Friday the Friday morning we had only started briefing some of our partners and I remember just giving them a whole lot of ideas of things to do and I could just feel in the room that people were thinking. So I was setting expectations. Yes. But how I kind of um, invited them to participate was important. So it wasn't about you better do this by this time or else. It wasn't that term. That Friday afternoon, I got a phone call saying, guess what? We're going to do this. And that's really my measure of how I show up. Because I don't think I would have gotten that kind of phone call. Um, if I didn't show up the way that I did. Um, it's early days for me, so I'm not sitting going, I've got this, but I'm certainly more aware of what's working and what's not working. Um, yeah. 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 I'm hearing that. And I'm also hearing this is this, there's some preparation. I'm, you know, one of the themes that's come through this conversation already is the importance of preparation. And so that example you just shared on the Friday, you had that call. What did you do to prepare yourself to turn up to that call, not to be contagious by the pressure that you knew were going to be in your, it was going to appear in your team? What What did you do in that preparation moment, Zani? Can you share that with us? Um, as in, not knowing what the call would be about, and yeah, and how do you you know you said I showed up in this space of you know. Uh, getting them into a great into a better place which proved yeah. to be um absolutely correct in the afternoon when they felt but what what did you you know I I'm often working with people who who are trying to work out what their preparation and often they're going back to back to things at the moment as I'm sure you can relate to and, and it puts that, that in itself puts pressure in the system so how do you separate before oh, what I would okay. call a really important moment like this call yeah. that you're describing, you know, yeah. what's your preparation to allow you to turn up to that and not just pitch up for that? Absolutely. I've learned to, I've, I've, I've used this phrase, I was reflecting a lot on this conversation. I've learned to walk away. Hmm. What I mean by walk away is not uh, leaving things to sort of crumble, but stepping out of the, the situation so that you could refresh your brain. I just find sometimes we clutter our brains and our brains just stop using any other, you know, patterns. They just go to that pattern that sets you on a, um, you know, that kind of rut where you are showing up badly. But I found if I suddenly stop and put the brakes and walk away, um, you come back with a clearer perspective on things. So before, a meeting or before that you know uh, that moment that you know is just going to create terror and frustration i find i do something very different um just to help my brain to to get back into it i remember again with my son he's teaching me a lot he was struggling to tell me something and i remember being so frustrated and i just got up and i said and it was bedtime i was tucking him and i said to him good night we'll talk about this tomorrow and I just walked and I left it because I realized if I'd stayed, mm -hmm. I would have been 
in this conflict with him and created a really bad memory before he's <laughs> before yeah. him going to bed. And I practiced this at work and realized walking away from a situation is a way of preparing for the phone calls or for that meeting because it's almost like you're teaching your brain to do something different or show or, or teaching yourself to show it works for me so this is really just something i've learned about myself just stopping um, so, so before something like um an important call or an important meeting at work do you create that gap then before going i mean do you yeah. do you literally walk out the building or do you literally walk away or yeah. do you just have a separation pause yeah. moment? What, what is it that it gives you the, the fuel and that moment that you need? So before this podcast, for example. Yes, <laughs> yes. good example. I, yeah. went, I went out to the shops. Right. <laughs> I didn't sit and mellow in the, you yeah. know, the nerves. I just literally got in my car um, and I did some of my meetings in the car and completely something different yeah. and came back and, forgot about I'd actually forgotten the pressure the me- that pattern of you know now you've got a podcast and it's oh what are you going to say yes. I completely broke it yes uh, came back and opened a book and then all of a sudden it was time and yeah. that's how I, I did it for me yeah. personally yeah I wish I did it all the time but it, I've tested it it seems to work <laughs> Yeah, I like that, that phrase testing yeah I mean, it's, it's yeah. interesting isn't it because in a way you've been testing that from from a young girl, when you just you when you, you choose to say something different, yeah. um, you know yeah. that that's that is a practice, isn't it? To train yourself to do that. It sounds like what you say to yourself is incredibly powerful for you, Zani. That's why I call pressure me. You see, pressure for me isn't something that sits outside of my myself. I think it sits within me. Um, and and so I found that's the starting point always is yourself um, yeah. because the situation around you you can't really control because it was always because of the other person and realized mm. I denied myself so much because of that and then yes. all of a sudden asked myself what would have happened if I had stayed or what would have happened if I'd said this or what would have happened if I didn't say this or I stopped or whatever the case may be. And those questions all have turned the situation back to myself. Yeah. And, and that's where the work sits right now. Yeah. And, and would you say that you are conscious of dialing up the pressure through your life so that you keep evolving like this? And, you know, or, or do, you, you know, do you get a sense of, of, of discomfort when you're staying in a plateau for too long or you know what, what, what's your relationship with pressure in terms of your own evolution it's so interesting i i create the pressure that's been the constant hmm. and so to answer your question it means like it means that i never you know pressure is never gone <laughs> from me it's always there and it's all created i remember again a role that I had and a colleague asked me why do you put so much pressure on yourself take that pressure off and I look around me and I look at colleagues or friends and I'm going sure they've made their lives so much easier but it only I only think like that for 30 seconds and then off I go (laughs) again and is that is that <laughs> is that smart. is that a habit that you just are used to and you've grown to accept it, or is it an actual choice because you believe that it's better for you? And there's that word, right? It was that no choice um, mm. discussion from a young girl that you've got no choice. You can't be like them. You know, maybe they can go home and knock off it too but you can't. It's carried through. It's stayed through, you know. You don't have that privilege. Gosh, Zani, that that sounds like um, something to bear rather than a choice to evolve. Um, It it sounds heavy. Yeah, it's not not a choice I'm making, as you're right. It is something that, that is about, you know, something to bear because I'm not sitting saying, Make that choice, son. You know, I'm sitting, going, "That's my life." You know, that, that's that's my path, 
And um, again, I remember a colleague saying, no, no, I, I said to a colleague, gosh, how do I get that job where I can just show up at work late for a meeting, um, you know, and just greet everybody in the meeting as if, you know, without a care in the world, not recognizing that, you know, the meeting is only starting 10 minutes late because of this individual. But this person is quite nonchalant about that. So I said to my colleague, how do I get that kind of job? And she said, Zana, you do have that kind of job. Yeah. You, know, you can do those things. You know, she said that to me. I just yeah. said, I thought, what does she mean by that? And, and, and hence why I'm saying, I think the pressure is, is in me and lives in me, with me. And I've told myself, there is no choice. It isn't a choice because that's how my life started. Um, yeah. And is that pressure for better then or is that pressure for whatever the opposite is, pressure for the sake yeah. of pressure? You know, I mean, you know, it's interesting because, you know, the podcast inquiry is around pressure for better so that we all grow and we keep learning and we keep evolving and it's like a a life enhancing mm. um, choice. I'm, you know, it doesn't sound like it in the way that you're describing for you. Yeah, I suddenly realized that, oh, it feels a bit somber in the room now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, no, 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 <laughs> it shouldn't. What I have seen though is, like I said, I'm extremely disciplined and very consistent in how I uh, perform and show up and in terms of getting things done. So I've I've become quite an asset in that regard uh, with people I work with. And, and I think for me, it does, uh, that becomes my value proposition wherever I go um, and, and has created a brand for myself. So I then okay. have a strong brand as a result, which creates that memory of reliability in those who, need somebody like myself okay. um yeah so so even yeah. though the story i've told may give you that feeling but in reality i would choose no other life in yeah life. i'm not sitting going what a terrible life i'm sitting no. going, i'm so glad in my 20s i worked so hard mm. because now i can relax even if i spend an extra year taking a break and going to live in another country, I can do that because of those um, foundations I've put in. Um, I can have my kids and I can enjoy mm. them. And, you know, I am yeah. benefiting in that regard because I can show up for my children and I can dream with them and help them achieve what they need to. Um, and there's this pattern. I always think of the pattern as my mom grew up in a, village i grew up in a township my children grew up in a suburb and mm. so you've got this whole trajectory that one sets and so if i look back i'm not regretting i'm not regretful about the choices i've made or the path i've taken or the approaches that i've you know, it actually feels like it's really connected to a very strong purpose actually for you for me it's it, it, it's so centered around who i am and my identity um, yeah. and, 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 and that's what drives it and, and creates meaning because I do find if one does not understand all of that, then pressure does become quite a, you know, like I use the word toxic, things can be quite toxic, I think. Yeah. So helpful. So, so interesting uh, hearing that connection you're making there, Zani. Thank you. Um, so at this point... I'd love to ask you, what two things would you pass forward for someone listening to this who would love to be better under pressure? Yeah. What would be your pay forwards? Yeah, spend more time being consciously competent about yourself. You know, try mm. not to look at things externally all the time. And I know you think, what's the connection with pressure? It just then explains how you create pressure and what sits behind the pressure because you'll understand that this is the pressure I need to perform, to excel. This is the pressure that I don't need. It's unuseful. It's unhelpful. 
um, because you do need pressure, I think, because you do show up better. Um, you do become a better person because you've achieved a higher standard. Um, but you've got to understand first why why is there that pressure because it sits himself. Um, so that's the first thing I would really yeah. And just on that, Zani, how would that how would someone do that? So I, I love this. It's self exploration. Yeah. What 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 might be a first step to somebody actually going internally rather than externally? You know, we talk about these self mastery courses, mindfulness, all of those things. They don't harm. Just do them. You know. Mm read that book, you know, I'm reading an amazing book by, uh, who's become a friend by Helen uh, Nicholson. Uh, she's written a book on mindfulness. And it's those things that I think are going to be helpful more than anything is, you know, take the book, do the course, just do it. You know, they don't harm. You know, I was very skeptical. I hate this concept of mindfulness because I'm going <laughs> to get practical. You know, I can't always light candles um, when I take a bath. <laughs> you know, that's really how I saw it all. But it actually helped me because um, the person who ran this particular workshop on mindfulness, she was in a place that I was once. And so I could connect with her. Yeah. And when she told her stories, they were exactly my stories. Um, so because I took that class, um, I allowed myself to just learn. So I think learning more about yourself is so important. No one else can help you do that. Um, yes. And that is why I think that's the first place to start if I had to make a suggestion. And the and second then, one? Do check yourself. Um, you've got to you go, go back and see. You know, is there growth? Is there change? Am I repeating? Am I in a pattern? And checking yourself happens in many different ways. It could mm. be just asking a friend. Um, like I said, look at the faces in the room. Yeah. Um, when you're in the room with people. Um, listen to what people are saying. Are, are the same people saying the same thing? Or is it everybody saying the same thing? Or a lot of people saying the same thing? Because... Uh, you know, I'm not saying listen to everybody, but I'm saying find a method that helps you check yourself. Um, and once you've done that, then you'll know that the first thing is is actually working because the second thing um, is becoming the third thing, which is a better you, um, actually. So, yeah, that's really love it. that I better you. Do. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so good. And I have learned something, actually. It's a bit of write it down before I forget. But thank you. I've definitely learned from this conversation. So really Brilliant. Fun. What is that? What is that, just as a matter of interest? Every time I get invitations like this, I've found that I learn in conversation. It's like my learning style. Me too. Me yeah. too. I, I, yeah. I, I struggle with lectures and all of that. And in conversation today, I've learned that I've understood why I, I'm the way I am. I could never understand. So my relationship with pressure is actually because of that little girl and what, what my parents had said about the no choice. I didn't know that before this podcast, so thank you. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. I love that. And, you know, what you've done, that, what you've encapsulated for me there, Zani, is why I wanted to do the podcast, because I'm just like you in the sense that I, yeah. I learn through conversations, through sort of... Yeah chewing something over with somebody I love that much more than anything else and that's why this for me is a fantastic way of exploring Absolutely. um and and to and to have you say that back to me has really helped me as to why I like yeah, conversations I and they don't yeah. actually happen I don't think enough in the workplace these 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 moments of conversation yeah. real proper conversing yeah with with peers and colleagues i think it, it's um it's an ingredient that i i think is really so beneficial of for speed although it's counterintuitive because people in organizations feel that a conversation can sometimes hold up speed and actually i think what it can so often do is is what we're just doing now no absolutely um in fact you know i've st uh, we we did something different for um a, a workshop we we said no PowerPoint allowed. We're not going to make people sit and hear, listen to somebody just throw massive amounts of data on a slide. We con we turned the whole day into conversation and laughter. 
and the memories, you know, that people have of that session, I don't think are the same as any other session. And so we did, we had our senior leaders in conversation with a room full of people Brilliant. around the project we wanted to do. Um, and then we made them all dance and laugh. Um, Wonderful. Yeah, yeah. So definitely, that's a different way to learn. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But uh, essential, I think, and more so than ever right now, the dancing and the laughter. Yeah, absolutely. Zani, thank you so much for your time. It's been fascinating talking through the various different parts of your journey that have impacted your sense of your relationship with Prussia. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Better Under Pressure with me, Sarah Milne Rowe. If you enjoyed it, please do subscribe and let us know what you found useful or what you'd like to know more about. Our aim is to share as many examples as possible of what people do to manage pressure for better. If you're interested in any of the practices mentioned, check out my book, The Shed Method. Alternatively, you can find us at Coaching Impact or me on LinkedIn and Instagram. Better Under Pressure was produced by the fab team at Smart Cookie Media. Thanks so much for listening and until next time, goodbye.